be conscious about who you spend your time with and be conscious about who you share your microbiome with because that also, uh, to your point, makes a huge difference in, in our health. One of the things that I argue that you can actually catch diseases from the people you live with, primarily through the microbiome that you exchange and the food that you exchange. How much of it is your control or the family member's control of what goes into their mouths, what they're doing? Is, is that a big factor? It's absolutely crucial that people with dementia have the support of those around them, right? It, like Darlene, she wouldn't have gotten the benefit of this if her husband hadn't made it happen for her, right? And especially as we progress down the disease process of dementia, we're more and more reliant on others. So it's up to them to make decisions that promote our health, right? But before that, we have control to a point. We are, what is the saying? We are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. And our spouse, our partner, makes a huge impact on what we decide to eat, what you know, the foods that show up in our refrigerator, the supplements that end up on the, on the shelf that are easy and accessible for us to take. At how much they exercise influences how much we exercise. So we want to be very conscious about who we surround ourselves with. As we age, we want to look to the people 10 years older than us. I want to age like that. And so I'm going to start spending more time with people like that. It's very easy for adults, especially to mimic the behaviors around them. And so be conscious about who you spend your time with and be conscious about who you share your microbiome with, because that also, uh, to your point, makes a huge difference in, in our health. There's a bunch of things. I mean, the, the ketogenic diet is one of the, where I've seen the, the flip side of the Darlene story, right? Where a spouse will bring in their partner, but they're not ready to go into ketosis with their partner yet. Mm -hmm. So there's cookies on the counter and there's bananas and fruit is not inherently bad. You know, the, um, there are great polyphenols and, and anthocyanidins and all kinds of benefits. But if the goal is ketosis, it's going to keep you from getting there. Sure. And so we want to make sure that your environment is set up to promote the goals, right? To, to help you get to the, achieve the goals that you have set. And if you have a spouse who's undermining that, it's not going to be helpful. Or if you have a caregiver or I had an adult child who was like, no, no, I want to have happy hour with my mom every day. And so she's going to have her scotch. If she has dementia, you're just adding another toxin that doesn't need to be in the system that's going to undermine her cognitive performance. Yeah, her right to have her piece of cake every day. She's always had a piece of cake every day, and it's cruel to take that away from her. How do, how do you handle that? For every family, there's different dynamics, unique dynamics, right? There are, yeah, as people age, you know, there's conversations around inheritance. There's conversations about how we treat our elders. There are very complicated dynamics that show up in families. And I've seen people who are sort of become martyrs to this, right? Who are so self-righteous in there, but we've got to do this diet this way. And mom's not getting the best care and somebody else is hurting her because she's not getting this or that. And I would offer that becoming the model yourself, taking that energy and turning it back towards what you can control. Again, just like our modifiable and unmodifiable risk factors. We can't change the unmodifiable ones. We can't change other people's behavior. To a point, sometimes we can, we can influence them, but we don't have ultimate authority over someone else's behavior. What we have authority over is our own. And so if we can take all this great information, your work, Dr. Bredesen's work, hopefully my book, it's gonna have an impact on people's lifestyle behaviors, Focus it on your own and become the model of good health, of optimal health, so that other people then see that and want more of it. And you become an authority through that path rather than trying to force it down someone's throat, which often leads to resistance. Let's talk more about the ketogenic diet. Long ago, with my Apple Wheat Fours, and I think, Dale, we were very afraid of fat for Alzheimer's and certainly my training as art surgeon, you know, fat's evil. And I think I've certainly come around and I know you've come around and Dale's come around. Why should we embrace a ketogenic diet, a lifestyle, MCT oils in, in people who we thought that this was deadly for? Right. I'm sure you're familiar with Mary Newport's work and there's been a a renaissance, I think, around how good fats are. And, and thank goodness, because our brain, the myelin sheath, as you well know, made of fat. We need fat. The brain prefers to burn ketones over sugar as fuel. As we age, we all become, regardless of diabetes status, we all become somewhat insulin resistant. 
We're not as efficient at burning sugar, turning it into ATP. It also creates oxidative stress when we're burning sugar for fuel. As you all know, the ketogenic diet can help with the reduction of fat-soluble toxins. It can be a detox diet, an anti-inflammatory diet, but it's also supportive generally of just better neurological function. What we see, and I think, you know, with common sense based on sort of ancestral diets, we're designed to go back and forth. I mean, the body is just, this divine design blows me away. It just inspires me every day. But we are designed as hybrid engines to be able to go back and forth between burning fats for fuel and burning sugar for fuel because our hunter-gatherer ancestors did not have blueberries available 365 days a year. They didn't have high starchy foods. They didn't have Kit Kat bars available 24 hours a day at 7-Eleven. Oh my gosh. Right? We're, not designed, <laughs> we're not designed to, to eat the highly profitable, highly palatable, highly processed foods that are available ubiquitously in our environment. We're designed for some famine. We're designed for whole foods, for the things that come straight from the ground, straight from the tree, straight from the animal. And so when we shift our diets into that, we see better cellular function. And with the ketogenic diet and fats, unfortunately, so many people, and especially my older women who were health conscious in the 80s and 90s, they remember that food pyramid, right? And this this and the Women's Health Initiative study, I mean, the two biggest failures in medicine in America, this idea that we were meant to get grains as a foundation of our diet and that fats were vilified. Well, now when I suggest ketogenic diets to women, older women, I have to be really careful that I explain how good fats are because what they hear is that sugar and, and carbs are bad. They reduce that, but they're still afraid of fats and they start being undernourished and losing too much weight. So we, I really have to emphasize these fats are not terrible for you. They are actually good. They are a source of fuel. They are healthy. And particularly if you choose the right ones, right? I'm not, we're not talking about a bacon and cheese diet. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry to disappoint everyone, but lots of olive oil, avocado, all of these coconut oil. And I'd love to get your insights. Mary Newport, you know, she suggests that coconut oil actually can be good for people with ApoE 4.4. I've had patients where I've seen actually lipid profiles improve when they're consuming coconut oil. Um, but I know that there's also a caution there with ApoE 4.4 and the, the metabolism of saturated fats. With my patients, I like them to have MCT oil. For them, coconut oil, I see their Lipid, their small, dense particles really go up and uh, they oxidize their particles a lot more. So coconut oil, at least in my patients, is still off the list. However, I like particularly goat and sheep-based cheeses and yogurts because about 30% of the fats in goat and sheep are actually MCTs, medium chain triglycerides. And I don't think it's a surprise that four out of the five blue zones are sheep and goat herders. And there's a huge amount of goat and sheep products in their diets. And it's, it's kind of pushed under the table by my good friend Dan. But it's, no, I don't think it's a shock that four out of the five blue zones are big time sheep and goaty. And interested. I'm so pragmatic when it comes to the ketogenic diet. I want people to feel satisfied. I yeah. want it to be an accessible diet that they're able to do. And I think that adding some of that dairy, the sheep and goat dairy, the E2 dairy potentially, that makes it very satisfying, particularly when you're having those sugar cravings in the first few days. Right. How do you advise everybody, particularly, I guess, the caregivers, how do you get past these sugar cravings? Because it's very true. Your brain lies to you that your brain is starving for sugar, which it is, and because it can't utilize it. Right. And it says, oh my gosh, you know, you've got to go find some sugar. And I, you know, I, I hear it in my patients. I see it in my patients. How do, how do you help? I get into ketosis three, four times a year. And I call them my donut days because I haven't had a donut in 15 years. I'm a naturopath, right? I gave that up long ago. However, I can't stop thinking about donuts for about 24 hours when I'm going into ketosis. And it's, it is exactly what you were just describing. It's this physiological addiction to sugar. And when that comes up, I recommend that patients, one, be prepared for it. So fat bombs are one of my strategies, personally. I get a 32-ounce mason jar and I fill them with fat bombs before I'm planning to go into ketosis. So that if I have a hankering for something sweet or chocolate or salty, I can grab one of those and it'll reduce that craving. It'll hit that craving and I won't need more. And then high fat, 
getting really high fat foods in and protein can help with satiation so that you're not going through these blood sugar spikes and drops. Often those drops lead to the biggest hankering for sugar. And so then also, you know, just being prepared for it, I think gives us that reassurance that it's temporary. We're going to get through this. In three days, once I'm 72 hours into carb restriction, I'm going to get to the other side. Another good strategy is exogenous ketones, which often can taste, they're, they're very sweet. I don't love the taste, but I will use them in those first few days to get my ketones up before my blood sugar has fallen. And that can help me get up over that hump as well. Okay. But you got to keep all the carbs out of the house. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that... And particularly for people with dementia, they're not going to remember that they can't have that apple. So they're going to have that sugar craving, walk through the kitchen, see an apple and grab it, let alone a cookie, you know. Yeah. And so cleanse your kitchen is one of the things that we, we guide people to do. And I've had someone say, oh, I can't, I can't get rid of that bottle of soda. I, I paid for that. I bought that. It's toxic. Just get rid of it. Just throw it away. You do not need that. It does not serve anyone. And, you know, I think there's a, a spectrum there, but getting, cleansing the things from your house that are going to be tempting, especially those go-to easy quick foods, make sure you have an alternative. And in your pantry, you can even design your, your pantry so that what's at eye level is the quick but keto-friendly foods. What's below or above what you can see are the, those things that you maybe want to hide from yourself for a few weeks or a few months. Yeah, because a lot of my patients say, oh, gee, you know, I, I paid you know, good money for this stuff. I don't want to waste it. And I go, look, just give it to somebody you don't like. I'm sure you've got several <laughs> exactly. neighbors that you want to poison. And they say, oh, that's a great <laughs> idea. Okay. All right. Last but not least, because this comes up all the time with my patients, what the heck is a cognoscopy? Is somebody going to put an instrument into my brain and look around or up my nose. So this, I love Dr. Bredesen for so many reasons, but one of them is because he's created these great visuals, right? That, that really stick with us that have a, an emotional impact. He's got many of them, but the cognoscopy is one of them. And it hits home because the cognoscopy, it's, it's uncomfortable, right? But it's a way to prevent a very serious disease. It's a way to catch it early. The risk factors, polyps that can lead to colon cancer over time. And you do it around the time that you're 50 to prevent the risk of disease. And his point is, if we can look for the risk factors for cognitive decline in our 40s and 50s, then we can reduce our risk of developing disease as we age. And so a cognoscopy is essentially systematically going through the medical workup to look at toxins, infections, nutrient deficiencies or imbalances, excess or, or deficiencies. So look at stressors. What is our cortisol doing? To look at sleep. Is it, do we have sleep apnea? Are we getting enough sleep? To look through all of those modifiable risk factors in a way that we can quantify so that we can identify things like mold toxicity or heavy metal toxicity or a herpes infection or a gingivitis that might cause, that pull that trigger that's going to produce beta amyloid plaques or misfolded tau proteins in our brain. So we can we can basically be empowered by this data, by this information, and reduce our risk when we look before we have symptoms, just like you would with a colonoscopy. Now, to kind of add some icing to the cake, you'd ask, is, are they going to put a probe in my, in my nose or up in my brain? No, but we can do imaging. And now we can look at things like PTAU-217, PTAU-181, our amyloid ratios. We can look at some of these tests that give us an indication of, are these changes already happening in our brain? We can do the neuroquant testing or the quantitative testing of the brain regions. We can also look at the arterial spin labeling, the MRIs that can give us a sense of our glucose uptake and metabolism in different regions of the brain. And these, although, you know, I kind of have these two categories when it comes to testing. In a cognoscopy, I would include both of those categories, but we have the tests that are going to drive the treatment plan. Right. If there is mercury, we want to get that out. That's going to be high priority. If your blood sugar is high, your A1C is elevated, your homocysteine is elevated, we need to change your diet. We need to add some supplements. We need to do things that are very actionable. You know, you and I are going to send our patients home with a list of what they're going to do. Now, when we look at the images or when we look at the, the P-tau or when we look at the amyloid ratios, they don't necessarily tell us how to change the treatment plan. What they do is they tell us where our baseline is. They kind of give us a measuring stick. So we're here today in 2024. Where are we going to be a year from now? Are we getting better or worse? 
And that I think of as kind of a luxury for my patients who are financially strapped. If they don't have, because those are not covered by Medicare right. at this stage, they are out of pocket tests. And so they're, for me as a researcher, as a clinician, I want them. I would love them. Please, Be, please get the imaging. A picture tells us a thousand, you know, so many things. However, if you're financially strapped, I, I leave those out at this stage because the actionable things are what's most important to me. And those are sort of a luxury. There'll be blood tests shortly that will be able to, you know, diagnose your risk of Alzheimer's. We're not talking about the APOE4, you know, circulating tau, circulating mm -hmm. beta amyloid. Something we should get or is it too yeah. soon to tell? So I love for all of my patients to get that they're not covered by Medicare. Right. So th they have to have the financial resources to do that. And we are still figuring out what they mean. So if you lose weight, if you gain weight, that will change those numbers. And that has to be taken into consideration. And I've had a few patients who have done them and they've come back abnormal and they are anxious as all get out. They can't sleep because they think this is a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. I, there was a patient who was seen on the East Coast, uh, actually a colleague of mine recently, and he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's based on those labs. Whoa. And I thought that that was really inappropriate and did him a disservice. He had been very anxious, couldn't sleep. He he was trying to figure out how he's going to live the rest of his life and what, to, you know, he was basically putting his affairs in order. Right. And I think that that was detrimental. I think that the stress actually had a bigger, had a poor impact on his on his health, the lack of sleep. And that isn't the interpretation that I have of those tests. When we see them, they're directional. So when we have longitudinal markers, we can see, are we going in the right direction or maybe are we not? But any one in and of themselves, it can go up or down. The, the amyloid ratios can go up or down if you get COVID or a cold or a right, flu. Right. They can go up or down if you lose weight or gain weight. And many people on our protocols are going to change their body composition. And so I think we need to take those markers with a grain of salt at this stage and I hope, I hope I have the privilege of running them on, on people who are well-resourced enough to get me the experience so that I can help other people interpret them over time and that we'll all learn together to make those useful tests. But right now, I think it, it depends on the person. Yeah, no, I think I, hopefully, or like you, I learn from every one of my patients. In Absolutely. Fact, I dedicated one of my books just to thank them for letting me learn from, from them. Yeah, yeah. And, more of, of these we can get people to get, it's very helpful. It's such a privilege. In fact, just throw this out, you talked about mold. I have two patients in LA who are, are renting a house and they're very conscientious about all these factors and we got mycotoxin tests on them and they both came really high for black mold. And they brought in two companies and they couldn't find any black mold in, in the house. And I said, well, that must have been the house you were living in before. Okay. So six months pass, and we retested them. They're still in this rental house. And the husbands, his have dropped almost out of the red. Dramatic drop. He's mm -hmm. kind of in the yellow. She hasn't changed one iota. And I go... And I, I saw him before I talked to him. I said, well, that's interesting. So we Zoomed, and I said, this is really weird. I, you know, do you guys sleep in separate bedrooms? You know, what's going on? And he says, oh, I've been on the road a lot the last few months, and I really haven't been home. And she said, and I haven't traveled at all. I've been home. I said, Wow, this is this is great information. You know, your house is killing you. <laughs> He's getting out. And now, you know, you need to take this to your landlord. You now have proof that, you know, you're in a sick house and this is killing you. But yeah, we learn, you know, wow, how come that how come you didn't change and he changed? No, I've been traveling. It's fascinating. I've had similar experience with the mold testing. Somebody will swear up and down, there's no mold in my house. There's no mold in my house. It's through the roof. And I'm going, there's something, there's something. And sure enough, this gentleman, I knew there was mold somewhere. He was denying it. And the roof, the ceiling above his bed dropped on him in the middle of the night one night. It was literally crumbling right above his bed from a 
rain that had gotten in through a roof leak that nobody knew about. And I think the takeaway for everybody is that this is not a a death sentence, and we don't want to just mark time by parking somebody somewhere. There are active things that you can do. I I actually write about it in my upcoming book, The Gut Brain Paradox, that you can change these things. It's exciting. It's exciting. Thank you for doing the work you do. It's time for our audience question. And... This one comes from Wager Lee on YouTube. They want to know, I heard on the news that the shingles vaccine dramatically reduces the chance of getting Alzheimer's. Should I get the vaccine? Well, what say you, Dr. Samson? So we know that the herpes simplex viruses are associated with risk of Alzheimer's. We know that they trigger amyloid plaque production, and we've seen this in epidemiological studies, those who are treated aggressively for herpes have less risk of Alzheimer's compared to those who are not. Now, the shingles vaccine is also part of the herpes virus family. This is a neurological virus. It's in the nervous system. And what it makes a lot of sense to me that if you don't have a shingles outbreak, if you can prevent that through a vaccine, that you're going to have a lower risk of developing Alzheimer's. And so I do recommend that in the, there's two different herpes, or excuse me, two different shingles vaccines, and it's the newer one, the Shingrix one, that is the one that has the most reduction of risk. Interestingly, the reduction of risk and the delay of dementia that's associated with that vaccine is the same as the amyloid monoclonal antibody therapy. So it's on par in terms of outcomes with that. So you're not getting an improvement in cognitive function if you have dementia with this vaccine, but you are getting a reduction of the risk of developing dementia. And I think that's worthwhile to take advantage of as we age. I have seen in my clinical practice, it's a two-part vaccine. So you need to get two of them to be protected. And I, I have seen in my clinical practice that I've had a handful of patients who end up getting shingles after the first one. And so that's just a curiosity to me. I don't know if there's an increased risk, but it's something that I've seen clinically. But I've also seen patients with shingles, and that is torturous. It is so painful. It interrupts sleep. It's very, very stressful to be in that kind of chronic pain. I've seen people end up addicted to gabapentin afterwards, addicted to pain medication. And so avoiding shingles, I think, is a worthwhile endeavor, especially as we age. More amazing episodes just like this one. Watch now. People who eat curry at least once a week have a 90% reduction in Alzheimer's compared to people who don't eat curry. 